Today I'm wanting to talk to you maybe a little something uh, more inspirational this morning to kind of get uh, the creative juices flowing. And so I want to really bring up how Gensler is working across the globe with our clients to help uh, build and imagine their future. Uh, as a creative partner, we really work closely with organizations to help unlock new potential value and opportunities for them. And at the same time, also solve creative problems that they're facing today. Uh, that's why this year, um, and through our experience with all of this, we've realized that when our clients thrive, so do the cities that they live in. So that's why this year's design forecast is focused on the shaping the future of cities. Um, we'll be diving deep into our Gensler Research Institute information today uh, to really to see how the role of how design plays in creating places where people live, work, and play across the globe. Now, at Gensler, research fuels our creativity and inspirational spirit. That's why in 2009, we founded the Gensler Research Institute, which essentially is a, a, a way for us to explore the intersection of design, business, and behavior in the pursuit of solutions that improve the built environment and enhance the human experience. With how much work we do with all of our clients, we have a plethora of information that we can pull from across all of our projects, and we end up publishing this information every year, so you can go to gensler.com to learn more, but we're gonna be tapping into some of this today. Now, with all this research, of course, can't be done with our diverse amount of talent that we have. We have over 6,000 people working globally that speak more than 80 different languages that originate from more than 90 different countries and have graduated from more than 1,000 different universities. That is a massive amount of talent that we have, and it's one of our key reasons why we're so successful, along with uh, our global reach and local impact that this drives. We have 48 offices around the world, and this is continuing to grow every year. Um, each office has a very unique feel to it that is representative of the city that it's in, and they have also deep ties to the local community as well. But at the same time, they all feel just a little bit like home and what we call Gensler. Uh, and yet, um, they can still tap into this full potential of the firm if they need to. Uh, we call this our one firm firm mentality. We can have up to four to five in, or even more offices working on a single project at a time. And even with all the traveling I do, I can go to any one of these offices, be welcomed by my colleagues, and sit down and have the same working environment that I do at home or any of the other offices. It's really amazing and that this is one of our core foundations of uh, the firm, is the, the way we can collaborate with each other. And this leads us to a massive amount of work that we do. We worked with over four to 300 clients last year across 10,000 different projects and in 2,500 2, cities. This essentially equated to 1.4 billion square feet of work done just last year alone. Uh, and we're continuing to do more and more every year. So there's a good chance you've actually experienced a Gensler project and may not have even known it, and we're gonna show a few examples today. And so with all of this work, we have a really, really huge impact on the world, as you can see here with this map. So with great impact comes great responsibility. Sorry, I had to throw in that little cheesy line, but seriously, uh, <laughs> if we're doing this much work and we're having this big of an impact on the world, it's kind of our, we take a, a, a level of responsibility in making sure that we're doing the best for the human experience. Uh, because if we can't make a positive impact for everyone, then why are we really doing all of this work to begin with? And that leads us to the uh, Gensler Experience Index, uh, or EXI for short. Uh, this is a result of a multi-year survey and effort to help identify and quantify the design elements that go into the human experience. We surveyed more than 4,000 people and also did more than 60 hours on one-on-one -on -one ethnographic surveys with people to help get a deeper understanding of the reasons why people do what they do and where they go and how design impacts their behavior and ultimately how to design better spaces for better human experience. An experience starts with why. Uh, a fundamental element of design, uh, designing for experience, is understanding a person's intention and how it frames their experience uh, through design. And there are a myriad of reasons that really play into this factor, but we really narrowed it down to five key modes of experience. We have task, social, discovery, entertainment, and aspiration. And we can take these five modes and we can wrap them around a framework of essentially how design drives experience. And that really comes down to the interactions we have, uh, the expectations we have, and the actual space in the design of itself. 
you know, expectations pretty much are this precognition that you have before going somewhere that someone may have told you about or you've seen online or read about something. And the interactions are definitely what, you, what happens during the, uh, your time at that space. So I mean, imagine the last time you had an interaction at a restaurant, for instance, if you got bad service, you may not want to go back. Uh, and then also think about the space. The actual design of this place plays a huge factor into the experience. So much so that we pretty much can equate a better design equals a better experience because users who rated a space's design as excellent rated having a two times better experience than those who didn't. And we really narrowed it down to six key design factors to have an exceptional experience in a, in a space. Beauty, novelty, authenticity, clarity, inspiration, and a sense of welcome. Uh, you cannot have an exceptional space without pretty much all of these. I mean, just really think the last time you were somewhere that you really, really enjoyed, and you most likely experienced one, if not all of these. So looking at some of the future trends coming up, uh, the biggest one that we've noticed is that single-use spaces are becoming obsolete. Retail is no longer about going and buying something. Offices really are no longer just a place we work. And public spaces are really no longer these empty gaps and voids between buildings. Because pretty much today, everyone is doing everything everywhere. We have these little powerful computers in our pockets that pretty much open endless possibilities of what we can do. And we can see this here mainly by uh, some of our survey data, that 64% of people who are going to retail do multiple activities, 94% of people who visit public spaces do multiple activities, and one of my favorites, 98% of us do non-work-related activities at work. Um, I'm sure there's probably a business owner freaking out about that, but I'm going to tell you it's okay because this is actually really important. Uh, because one of the other trends is that uh, we need social spaces, and if you ignore this in your design, uh, it will be at your own peril, because we are very social creatures. And spaces that have uh, the ability for us to interact and collaborate with each other, each other have a much better likelihood of being recommended. There's even a higher satisfaction in the workplace with social. So looking at this, we can see that 65% of people who go to retail do it with, more their, with their family and friends. 85% of people who visit public spaces do it with their family and friends. And about 49% of us like to socialize with our colleagues outside of the office. So social is extremely important in the design factor. And on top of that, technology also plays a huge role, but probably not in the way you think. Technology is actually more about the perception than the actual fundamental use that it brings to a space. Uh, people see it as a symbol of innovation when they visit a place. So if you're really wanting to impress someone, whether it be your clients or your employees, having tech the latest technology will drive that perception for you. And we can actually even see that here. There's a huge amount of gap, especially in the workplace. That is a 51% difference in experience level that is driven by just having the latest technology visible in the office. It's a huge amount of uh, cost and, and savings there with that investment. And so all of this brings us to shaping the future of cities. We're taking a lot of this now into our practice and really uh, evolving and looking at even more trends with uh, the design forecast. Now, the design forecast actually has over 200 trends. We're only going to talk about a handful today because I only have about 28 minutes left. Uh, so we're going to just keep on moving. Uh, working with uh, design, we're seeing that there are about five global disruptors that really play into designing the future of cities. Uh, demographic shifts being one. Millennials are playing a huge part into that. That's my generation. But also, at the same time, baby boomers are retiring at an alarming rate. And what do we have to do with them? So the demographic shifts are changing the, the, the ground. Uh, there's technology-driven disruption. Uh, Self-driving cars are really going to change how we look at roads and, and our infrastructure in cities, along with looking at new services like these electric scooters. I don't know if anyone's seen those in cities yet. They're pretty popular in America right now. Um, so those are also playing in a way of how people get around. There's also rapid urbanization. There is an astounding amount of people moving into cities uh, day after day. About 85% of the global GDP now comes from urban areas. There's also climate change, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then global volatility is essentially politics and economy, and we won't touch too much on that today. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So at Gensler, we, have, uh, we divide all of our work into three key sectors, work, lifestyle, and community. And within those sectors, we have about 40 to 48 different practice areas that we really key focus on. Uh, it's probably easier for me to tell you what we don't do, and that's pretty much residential. Uh, we pretty much have our hands just in about everything else. So we're going to look at 
some top trends in work to begin with, and I feel like when we start with work, we kind of need to start with the office buildings. Um, that's a pretty key factor in a lot of our uh, in a lot of our daily lives, office buildings play a huge part, especially if you're working in a big corporation. And so we've got some trends up here, most notably that uh, higher performing buildings equal higher returns, and even then higher performing buildings equal healthier employees, which then essentially create higher productivity because a healthy employee is going to work better and be more happy at work. And on top of that, uh, we've got the multimodal experience here again that we can see trending over the past couple of years that mixed-use buildings have become extremely popular. Again, having a space that does more than just one thing uh, is, is definitely becoming more and more important and relevant these days. And then on top of that, the brand of the corporation or the, or the client we're working with has to really, really come through to help portray the experience for the employees. And so then, with that, we're going to talk about a little tech company out in San Jose called NVIDIA. I'm sure most of you know that. Um, I actually had the privilege of working on this project. This is their headquarters in San Jose, Santa Clara. And the question we got uh, at Gensler from the CEO is, how do we make 2,500 people collaborate? And through a lot of extensive research, we pretty much came to the conclusion that you have to get as many employees on one floor as possible. Uh, it's staggering the amount of connections that are lost when you split employees by floors, and most importantly, when you split employees by different buildings. Uh, if you do by buildings, the collaboration pretty much goes to nothing. Um, so the design for this new campus uses an iconic ar architectural expression to publicly showcase the innovation that uh, is currently occurring at NVIDIA. Uh, the main entry exposes a lot of pu uh, public uh, collaboration spaces to the outside world, and actually draws employees and visitors through the inside of the building, which we'll take a look at here. Uh, the building is 500,000 square feet on two floors, uh, and that's pretty big. Uh, the center of the building is what we call the heart, and this is where employees and visitors will actually come up through a central staircase, and all of the amenities and conference rooms are located here in the center as well to help drive people to have more collaboration. You might have a spontaneous bump in with a colleague that you haven't seen and spark a conversation that way. Uh, the four plates are in the shape of a triangle, which also enhances the convergence of people and facilitating these spontaneous interactions, which was pretty much one of the key drivers that uh, the CEO wanted to see. Uh, unifying the large floor plate is this very structural, iconic uh, triangular roof uh, that pretty much symbolizes the company's identity, of course, the triangle being the basic building block of 3D. And uh, its undulating form serves to help bring a human scale to everything, which we'll see soon. Uh, it's pretty much, we designed this to be efficient in every way through the use of space, energy, the environment, and cost, taking a cue from chip design that essentially focuses on how the connectivity of data and information flows across the chip. We did the same thing with the floor plate design and, and trying to maximize how people move through the space. Uh, the building was designed from the inside out with the workplace being the key design factor driving the rest of the design. Uh, Natural daylight and fresh air is pretty much abundant. We have a massive amount of skylights, including a big one in the center of the heart to bring in as much daylight as possible. The work bars are 135 feet wide to pretty much ensure uh, that they're never 65 feet from natural daylight in the space. Daylight is a huge factor when helping in increase productivity in a workplace because people like more natural light than they do artificially. With this inside-out approach, the uh, design of the building and the architecture attains its iconic presence in Silicon Valley to help uh, maintain NVIDIA's culture and position as a pivotal driver in innovation in the, in the region. So now, moving on, if we have to talk about the office building, we're going to talk about the offices themselves. And wow, that really got messed up with that font, didn't it? Um, oh well, technology, right? Uh, <laughs> All right, so we're already seeing here, again, some big trends in and around having technology in the workplace itself. We're seeing a 3.7 times better experience for those who have it over those who don't. And then on top of that, that leads to a four times higher average profit rate with a two times higher average revenue just from having the latest technology available to your employees. That is big returns right there and just a matter of a small investment. So, good design equals a great experience and higher profit values. And if you want to know more about uh, meaningful workplace design, uh, you can go to this website right here to download our white paper and learn a little more on that. So, a good example of this is what we did for Microsoft in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, they wanted uh, to have a new 
headquarters there that really had a design philosophy in order to help inspire the most creative solutions possible for their business. Uh, the island and Dublin landscape concept is what we drove the innovation here around this design. And it really was the core factor in trying to solve the problem of the client, what the client wanted in essentially connecting everyone to everything. The concept of the trail is about flipping the typical circulation in space uh, and removing conventional corridors in an office building, and it essentially becomes all-encompassing. So now corridors in this, this area now include alternative work settings, support rooms, and circulations for employees that, can, that they can meander through to help drive more spontaneous uh, interactions, much like what we did on NVIDIA. We call this in the back of the mountain, and this is a vertical connect connecting feature that is essentially a highly visible meandering staircase, again, that has multi-uses as well. Inside of the staircase, we can find alternative work settings, breakout rooms, and meeting areas, and even some desking neighborhoods for more intimate workspaces. Uh, making its way down from the top floor, though, is a digital waterfall that you can see cascading down that can essentially be used to house big data or showcase off other features that Microsoft wants to do on their own. From the outset, we really had to approach this project differently. Like Microsoft wanted a space of the future, and we just couldn't design another typical office building. So we really had to think about what that meant and throw it out the window. So if you remember those 6,000 people I talked about, we brought in a slew of people who had no experience in, uh, in office design to really help with the design of this. We had landscape architects doing floor plans, and we brought in people with a retail and hospitality background to work with the workplace designers to really enhance the ex overall experience of the area. Uh, I think they even used Minecraft at one point to help with the design of this. Yeah, go figure, right? Um, even though Microsoft is this big, massive global tech giant, they really were adamant about bringing the local culture of Dublin into the design. Uh, there needed to be a sensitivity and awareness um, for the people working there, as well as also respecting the overall global, global brand in Microsoft. This, in this workplace, the building and landscape pretty much do help bring an ecosystem for its employees, allowing them to function at the best of their ability while enjoying and working in an environment that is uh, aesthetic, playful, and essentially Microsoft. So moving along, we're going to talk more about our play sector, which is lifestyle, and we'll drive right into sports stadiums. Now, whether you do or do not like sports, the, these things are, aren't going away because they're pretty much becoming these anchors in cities now. They are really these all-encompassing all experience centers. Stadiums now just aren't really for sports, but they're a local venue now to help with all kinds of different events. This actually helps drive additional retail and hospitality design in and around the stadium itself, which really helps start to revitalize certain urban areas and really anchor them in their neighborhoods. Team owners and, teams and owners are starting to essentially blur the lines between fans and players with digital technology. Uh, more so now, the ever-connecting uh, way we experience online is bringing players and fans together in real time, and stadiums now are even introducing virtual reality experiences, better ticketing solutions, and uh, multi-screen activations at stadiums to help engage the fans even more during game day. And even on top of this, eSports is rising. This is astounding. Last year, they made $1 billion in revenue and are expected to do even more this year. So that's something we're actually looking at trending very well. So with that, we're going to look at the Bank of California Stadium in Los Angeles. This was essentially us trying to create a special place for soccer in America with an international appeal. Uh, that was the challenge that was given to us by the, for the design team, and realized both in form and function, this uh, is a benchmark facility that should actually be something you definitely check out if you ever do go to Los Angeles. It's considered to be one of the most uh, modern and elegant soccer stadiums in the world, and yes, I, I know it's football here, but uh, this is in the U.S. Uh, but this is the home of the Los Angeles Football Club, um, one of uh, the MLS's uh, newer expansion teams that just pretty much started this past year or two. And uh, we designed this new 22,000-foot uh, seat stadium uh, in LA's Exposition Park right outside of downtown, which helps anchor the Figueroa Corridor and bring the uh, downtown skyline into view and really bring that area together. So uh, we really had an emphasis on the game day experience and really trying to capture a more personal relationship between the players and the fans. Uh, and so we definitely took a really extensive look at the European style of design for soccer stadiums and brought that to America. 
Uh, there are significant ancillary programs in the stadium that also include entertainment, retail, and additional dining opportunities, as well as being connected to uh, nearby museums and the Southern California University campus. So some fun facts about this stadium is that it's the first open-air stadium to be, be built in Los Angeles since 1962. Uh, it was built on the site of the former LA Sports Arena. Uh, the closest seat to the pitch is only 12 feet from the line. Uh, the bowl is one of the steepest at 34 degrees, and the pitch has uh, 86,000 square feet of Bermuda grass. There are also included 440 bicycle spots, including a bike trail around the area as well. And 5% of the parking is actually EV certified for electric vehicles, with an additional 20 spaces having the infrastructure for electric charging. Uh, essentially, this is set to create about 3,000 new full-time and part-time jobs over the next few years. We really wanted the stadium to be a place where fans can bring families, create new traditions, and really overlay their stories. Um, a collective memory is really what we were looking for because the city wants to make this an iconic place for themselves and to have LA's team. Uh, the LA Times calls this one of the most, uh, or called this project the launching pad for the MLS construction boom. Uh, DC United and Minneapolis United have actually both opened stadiums since this one, uh, and apparently each one could be arguably better than the other, but I might be a little biased on this one. So with all that, brand becomes a really, really important factor into experience as well. Uh, never underestimate the power of a good brand. Uh, great bands connect with their users on an emotional level, and, and in an increasingly saturated market these days, brands should, use, um, should create seamless user experiences to help unify their brand and define, inspire, and engage their consumers. More than half of consumers think that um, less than half of brands create uh, content that resonates as authentic, but 86%, because 86% of people think that authenticity is a key factor when deciding what brands to support. And here we are seeing the multimodal experience again coming into play, uh, because people who rate their experiences significantly higher in places are more likely to recommend that place as their favorite, and branding plays a huge part into that experience because it helps to find who that, per or who that company is, essentially, or what that space is. And then we're starting to see the rise of something called microbrands. Now, I don't make these terms up, I just do the research. But microbrands are these small, uh, recognized brands that are really in specific geographic locations or niche markets. Uh, and through the internet, we're starting to see an explosion of them because the new uh, trends and being able to social, use social media to get brands out there are playing them more and more into that role. So I wanted to change it up a little bit and talk about uh, a little company that uh, is out of San Antonio called Burger Boy. And we've looked at re three really, really big projects so far, so I wanted to, to bring it down to scale a little bit and show we do, so, we do smaller projects, and we're not just this big, big empire, in a sense. <laughs> but uh, exploring on the legacy and drawing up from nostalgia, the original Burger Boy, um, this is a new prototype that brings the, their iconic burger brand into the new century for a new generation to enjoy. Uh, this new prototype is a comprehensive package that we did of base building architecture, interior design, and overall branding. Serving uh, their beloved burger since 1985, and actually uh, their family was the original founder of Burger King. They sold their brand off to that, um, I think a little previously before this. Uh, Burger Boy has a very lo uh, loyal following in San Antonio, and in a sense has a very big nostalgia for San Antonio. Uh, while serving as a source of inspiration, uh, the new design it, uh, reinterprets their iconic, iconic elements in a new modern, fresh way. The recognizable A-frame from their, their original designs helps now create a more open and uh, bright jewel box dining experience. And the architecture is also very noticeable, uh, including their branding colors of the blue, orange, and white, including also their big mascot on the side of the building. Uh, the new iconography of burgers, uh, fries, and their famous orange freeze drink uh, help communicate the brand in a new, refreshing way. And uh, there's also an even dedicated selfie wall to help engage consumers on social media with the brand as well. Uh, together with nostalgia architecture and the expanded interior space, this has already been welcomed into San Antonio and into Burger Boys, uh, branding as their new uh, local legacy moving forward. And last but not least, we do have to talk about community, which is essentially is how we all live together. And when talking about that, probably one of the biggest things we do need to address is 
climate change, because this is definitely shaping the future of cities as we know it. Uh, whether or not what you, what you know on this or think about this, it is happening. And so we focused a lot of research this past year on our strategies for resilience design moving forward. Currently, about 58% uh, of our buildings are performing better than uh, buildings of their same uh, magnitude, including our interior spaces are doing about 29% better than interiors of their same design. Uh, and on top of that, if, 20 per if all of our projects performed as well as our, 20, our top 20% of projects, we would actually offset about 2 million metric tons of CO2 a year. So some really staggering uh, statistics here, which is why we put a very, very heavy emphasis on this. So in our research, we divided into six different categories, but really we're only going to talk about one today. And the one that's really, really important to me is water. Because I don't know how many of you know, back about two years ago in Houston, Texas, we got hit by a hurricane called Harvey, and the entire city flooded. We're talking about 10 to 11 feet of water in some areas. It was 56 inches of rain in 48 hours, something that was never heard of before. And the city's built to flood. We flood all the time, but we, to that degree, like, it was just astounding. Like, I was locked in my apartment for three weeks, so I sadly don't have any really good photos to show you that are mine, because I just couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, and it's really amazing that even with all of this rain, the city sank two centimeters. So it's something really important that we have to focus on because at the end of the day, 2.3 million of us were affected by water and it was coming from a storm. It's not even sea level rising, but there are about 24 to 26 major cities around the world that are going to be drastically affected with even just six feet of sea level rise. And we'll look at that here with Miami. And Miami is really taking this seriously because it'll probably be one of the first cities affected by this. And so we've done some research and um, exploration on what potentially Miami could do with a lot of retrograding of buildings and moving up, um, adding more um, grading to public spaces, adding elevated tra public transportation, uh, transportation. And here on the top right, you can see the map of uh, Miami, what it would look like with six feet of sea level rise. And remember, Houston got 10 to 11 just from rainfall. So this is a pretty, pretty important topic to us, and I wish I could go into it more, uh, but I am running out of time a little bit, so moving on. Uh, I thought this might be very interesting in, in our city. We could, we could talk about urbanization, we could talk about major master planning, but I think one thing that's really all important to us in this day and age uh, is cloud technology. Uh, so I wanted to touch on our practice areas, what we call critical facilities, which essentially are data centers. And uh, right now, uh, Data centers are extremely important because cybersecurity is the number one thing that keeps most CEOs up at night. Uh, and we're starting to see a 12% growth over the next few years into 2020 in this area as well. But on top of that, we're really having to build and integrate data centers into neighborhoods because we're seeing a shift on the retail side, starting to use a lot of abandoned properties, a lot of abandoned retail spaces, and having them being converted into data centers themselves. So one of our top projects here that we've done was a, the CPIC Sheng, Chengdu Ch uh, Data Center in China. And this was designed for the China Pacific Insurance Company. This is a 188,000 square feet project. And it is compromised of a uh, cube-shaped structure with a rectangular cutout voids that essentially create a office tower and an amenity space, the data center itself, and underground parking for the neighborhood. Uh, these voids in the structures uh, also create informal meeting spaces and access to, from the street up to the rooftop garden. The building is encased by an exterior wall of clear diamond-shaped double-glazed panels, and this helps contribute to the diffusion of solar light within the space to really give the building uh, a really nice quality and feel and perception inside. Uh, the basic form has, uh, the, you can see again, the diamond shape pattern, which is also uh, representative of the client's diamond service quality that they like to give, and uh, helps establish their ethos around strength, stability, reliability, and transparency. The multifunctional spaces like public green space and rooftop also help uh, build into the uh, environment around to make it really feel a part of the neighborhood. The office lobby uh, is of a 65 meter, uh, meter high atrium, uh, and the center uh, is a unique curtain wall that houses mixed mode ventilation systems. So the building can be either cooled mechanically or it can actually be open and cooled through natural ventilation, really helping with the performance of the building overall. 
Now, the result is essentially a building, a facility that weaves uh, the human and uh, mechanical interactions uh, while expressing elegance and design in the uh, com company's operational process. And last but not least, uh, one of the biggest factors in a city is probably an airport, because this is the first, probably the first thing we experience when going to a new destination is the airport itself. And these are really becoming multimodal experience centers. Uh, and also, technology is playing an even bigger role in helping trying to streamline the experience while traveling. Uh, you know, companies and airports now are looking to uh, really connect all the points and make it as seamless as possible from you get to, from point A to point B. Uh, with that in mind, uh, airs, um, there's even another level of hospitality coming through airports as well because of this, and we're now we're starting to treat airports as cities themselves because we end up do actually spending a lot of time here. So with that, we're going to look at the Incheon International T2 Terminal in Korea, which was a huge project that we collaborated with Harim Architects on. And this helps, um, we help design and create a very calm, uh, refreshing and, uh, building that helps entertain and ex uh, excites passengers while encouraging them to engage in the Korean culture. Created with the passenger connectivity in mind, there's multiple ways to get here from public transportation between buses, cars, taxis, and trains. And also, we helped really reduce um, transitions between connecting flights as well. Now, when designing this 4 million square foot terminal, uh, we asked how large can an airport design uh, become to feel like a community rather than just a simply a shopping mall with airplanes tacked onto the side of it. And how would we design it to help reflect Korean traditions? And how do we incorporate parks and recreational areas to really offset the, uh, and augment the use of the retail spaces? So the team approached this uh, with a conceptual design focusing on creating essential structural shapes which interpreted the curving and of, intertwining of wings so we get these really nice flowing motions. And this helps create smooth surfaces that relate specifically to passenger areas below using uh, the geometry to define specific areas for dining, entertainment, shopping, circulation, and passenger processing. Uh, pretty much this has helped uh, create um, cultural experiences unique to Korea, designed specifically to reduce passenger stress, enhance passenger convenience, and overall create delight. These areas exchange allow uh, passengers more themselves to remove themselves and really experience a lot of art, culture, music, and the splendors of Korea, creating a series of amenities and experience well beyond the typical uh, boutique and retail. Uh, there are actually museum, live performing areas, uh, distinct dining experiences, spas, yogas, meditation, and uh, exercise functions as well in this airport. So overall, that is a really brief look at what, how we're designing the uh, futures of cities, but I really do recommend all of you uh, go to our website and check out the rest of the design forecast and some of our other publications because really we, we did about 200 of these. So definitely take a look and um, thank you so much. Yeah.